We have another great crowd tonight, and we're especially thankful for that. We're glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll be able to relax, to feel comfortable. Hopefully you don't go to sleep, get too comfortable, but we do hope that you will enjoy yourself and feel like this is a wonderful time of fellowship that we have with one another and worship that we have with one another as well. Now, again, I would like to commend our brethren who have led us in worship, those who have led these songs, and our brother who has led our prayer. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for taking us, in a sense, even before the very throne of grace and allowing us to pour out to God our worship and our needs and our thanksgiving to him as well. You know, the Lord faced many crises during his three-year public ministry. These crises were real. They were not imaginary. And in fact, some of these crises may have been so severe that they possibly could have affected or even ended his public ministry. The first crisis, of course, involves the time when Jesus was tempted by the devil. Now, you remember that occurred very early in his preaching. In fact, it was right after his baptism, just about as soon as he was baptized. The Bible says the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. And I'm convinced that those temptations were real. They weren't fake. They weren't something that didn't affect Jesus at all. I believe that they had to be true, true uh, problems, true things that could really trouble him, true temptations, or what would have been the purpose of having them. Uh, you remember that the devil gave him three temptations, and all it took would be Jesus stumping his toe on one of those temptations. And Jesus could not have been the same. But a second crisis occurs about two years after this. And it occurs about one year before what we're studying here, the Passion Week. About one year before the death of Christ. And that's found in John chapter 6. Now in John chapter 6, Jesus preached a sermon that was particularly hard. And some people had trouble with it. In fact, the Bible says that some of the disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who can handle it? Who can deal with it? And they left him. Now imagine that. Disciples of Jesus left him. They departed. And it's at that point that Jesus turned to the apostles and said, Will you also leave? Now that's a moment of crisis. Because these men could have left. If they agreed with the ones who did leave that this was a really hard sermon and they couldn't agree to it and they couldn't stand it. If they had left, then Jesus would have had some problems. No, in continuing his public ministry. But the third crisis that was really tough and really severe for Jesus was his time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we come tonight in our study of the Passion Week, the time that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I would like to turn over to Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to begin with verse 36, and we're just going to read the Bible's description of what goes on at Gethsemane. I know this is very familiar to you, but it is a beautiful passage, as you will see as we go through it. The Bible says, And Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two of the sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter the temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Continuing on in verse 42, again the second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away to him, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? 
Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, have you ever heard the expression that we're standing on holy ground? Generally, you use that expression, that little statement in reference to being in a situation where something really very, very important or something is very holy in the situation. Now, we know where that phrase comes from. It goes all the way back into the Old Testament when Moses approached the burning bush and God said to Moses, take your shoes off for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. God wanted Moses to know that you are entering in my presence and this is very special and you must honor and recognize me for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. I want to suggest to you that tonight as we come to the Garden of Gethsemane, in the same sense, we also have to remember that we are approaching something that is very special and is something that carries with it great truth and extreme importance. There's a sense in which when we come to Gethsemane, we are standing on holy ground. Because you see, in this little story, we see a side of Jesus that we don't see very often in the gospel accounts. In fact, last evening and today, we're going to see some characteristics of Jesus that we really don't see very often in the gospel accounts. Last night, you remember, we saw an example of righteous indignation. Jesus really was angry with those people who were converting the worship of God in the temple. Today, this afternoon, we're going to see another side of Jesus as well. Now, we are in the midst of a little study on the Passion Week. I've been pointing this out to you from time to time. And the Passion Week, as we've said, is that last week of the Lord's life before his death, burial, and resurrection. And we have said that this week, for our purposes, begins on Sunday. And it's on Sunday, as you will remember from Wednesday night, that we studied the royal entrance of Jesus into heaven, the triumphal entrance, as it's sometimes called. And we saw that Jesus on that occasion made a public announcement, I am coming, I am your king, and I'm going to fulfill everything God wants me to do, just as he said, and I am in charge. We're not in charge, especially for the Jewish religious leaders. You may think you're in charge. You may think you're going to go about in private and arrest me and kill me and nobody will know anything about it, but it's not going to work that way. I am in charge of this situation. You are not calling the shots. You are nothing more than your palms in the hand of God when it comes to fulfilling his will. Jesus will walk into the city, go into the city, walk into the temple, look around, say nothing, and leave. Now, the next day is Monday. And remember that bright and early Monday morning, Jesus and the apostles head toward the temple. And it's on that occasion that Jesus finds that fig tree, and there's nothing on it, and he curses the fig tree and goes on into the temple. And the Bible then says that Jesus cleanses that temple. He turns the table over from the money changers and those who are selling doves, and he stops people who are walking through the temple and using it as a shortcut. And he preaches that very simple sermon that God's house is to be in the house of prayer for all nations, and you've made it a den of thieves. Now, this obviously angers the religious leaders to the extreme. And so I kind of think they spent Monday night in huddles in various places making plans for ruining Jesus the next day. Tuesday morning arrives. Bible indicates that Jesus and the apostles again go into the temple, and there he's going to find that these different religious groups are going to trot out their champions to engage Jesus in verbal warfare and hopefully shame and ruin him in front of the public. And we studied that last night. We looked in particular at the four different questions and the types of questions that these people asked on this occasion. Now, the Bible seems to indicate that when Wednesday comes, it, it seems to be a day of silence as far as Revelation is concerned. doesn't mean Jesus didn't do anything. 
it just simply seems to point out to us that not much is recorded on that day for what he did. So we really don't know much of what happens on that day. One of the few things that the Bible seems to mention happened on Wednesday is that to believe that this is the day that Judas agrees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now, we have come to Thursday. And Thursday is a day that's filled with action, especially Thursday evening. A lot of things are going to happen in Thursday, especially Thursday evening as well. Now, I want to begin our study by backing up a little bit and seeing just what did happen before Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the Bible tells us that on this evening, Jesus and his men, if I can get this to work, I'm not real good at this, so well, looky there. Jesus and his men would go to the upper room. Now, this is a map just for sake of identification. The Bible seems to indicate, or at least scholars seem to think, that this upper room was somewhere in the upper city, which means that it was a different part of the city, more wealthy people lived there, kind of a different world than the lower city. Remember, the lower city, we said, is where most of the Jews lived, and they were poor. And so the houses were much smaller. They were sort of crammed together. So it was a neighborhood with a lot of people and a very small space. Over here in the upper city, this is where more of the aristocrats lived and the officials lived. And it's believed that Jesus and the disciples met in an upper room in the upper, uh, in the upper city. Now, there are several things happening. One of the things that happened is that they prepared to eat the Passover. And Jesus made the statement that I have I have great passion to eat this Passover supper with you because it's not going to be eaten again until in the kingdom of God. Now, I think what Jesus means by that is this is the last official God-recognized Passover because, you see, Jesus is going to fulfill it. They're not going to need to observe it anymore after that. Now, we all know that the Jews did. We all know that for several years after that, the Jews continued to have the Passover, but it was simply that it wasn't God approved then because it had been fulfilled. Jesus became the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 tells us that Jesus is our Passover. And so that part had been fulfilled. After this, the Bible seems to indicate that Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. I don't know that getting everything here in the exact chronological order, but it all happened that evening. At some point, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. There was a lot of pride on their part. You know, they were all kind of jockeying for position in the kingdom, and they all wanted to be someone special in the kingdom. And lo and behold, when they got together, they were so proud that they wouldn't even wash one another's feet. And guess who did? The Son of God, their master would humble himself to wash the feet of these men. It's during this time also, you remember, that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Jesus would take one loaf and would tell them that this is my body. And Jesus would take one cup and distribute it to them and would say that this cup is a new covenant in my blood. And Jesus would institute, as we've said, the Lord's Supper. But that's not all. The Bible seems to indicate that Jesus had some special words for the apostle. And this is recorded in John chapters 14 and 15 and 16. And while these words, many of these words, were directed to the apostles, they obviously have application to us as well. They obviously have some teachings to us as well. And so Jesus said to the apostles, this is the way that you're going to live in the kingdom. Now, it's at some point, again after this that the bible tells us that jesus prayed the lord's prayer now do you know what lord's prayer is we commonly think the lord's prayer is matthew chapter 6 where jesus told the apostles pray like this our father in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come we oftentimes call that the lord's prayer but really that's just a model of prayer i would argue that the lord's prayer is found in john chapter 17 and it's there that the Lord prayed for unity among his people and among us as well. Now, at some point, after all of these events had taken place, the Bible indicates 
that they will leave the upper room and they will begin to walk through the deserted streets of Jerusalem to go outside of the city through the gate. Now, scholars believe that the time when they left was really pretty late. It wasn't very early in the evening when they left. In fact, some Bible scholars, and I don't know the, the exact truth of this, but there are some that have suggested that it might have even been close to midnight. Well, it may have been. Maybe it was a little earlier, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. We don't know. But the point is, it was late in the evening for people that are used to going to bed very early. As they left the upper room, the wrong one, let's see if we can get this. As they left the upper room, they begin to walk through the deserted streets of the upper city. They come to the gate that separated the upper city from the lower city and begin to walk through it as well. Now, in the lower city, again, you'll find that it's far more crowded and the streets really are far more narrow. And again, Bible scholars believe that there was a full moon during this time. And so with the full moon, there was a little bit of light. It wasn't completely dark when they walked out. And at the same time, you know, it wasn't very crowded. And they even believed that it probably had turned cold by this time, or at least it was very cool. Anyway, the Lord and his disciples make their way out of the city, out of the lower city, it's believed they go out one of the gates down here in the southern part of the lower city. And then outside of the city, they make their way along the Kidron Valley until they eventually come up here to the Mount of Olives. John chapter 18, verse 2 indicates that this was the place that Jesus pretty commonly went and that Judas would probably know that's where he was and that's where he would find him. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane was a garden of olive trees. And I know this is an artist's rendition, but it's thought that it probably looked something along that line as well. A, a garden, a beautiful garden, close to Jerusalem, full of these old ancient trees that produced olives and was an important place where Jesus, and in fact, and his men would go on various occasions. They came to the gate leading in to the garden. And the Bible says that Jesus left eight of the disciples there, probably to warn him if something was happening as he was trying to approach Father in prayer. He takes three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and goes into the midst of the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he's going to begin to pray. Now, Jesus is going to see three things. And this really is kind of the, the intent of our lesson scene. We're going to talk about three things that Jesus saw in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know, we see in different ways. We obviously see physically. We obviously see with our eyes and see the world in front of us. But there are other ways to see beyond just physically. We can see with the eye of understanding. You can take a child that struggles with math, really have a problem with math, and with a good teacher who faithfully work with that child, They'll work through that problem, and all of a sudden, the child will say, Now, I see how to do that problem. You see, he's talking there about seeing with the eye of understanding. And sometimes we see in the sense that we remember things from the past. And in that sense, in a figurative way, we see. Now, I want to suggest to you that Jesus sees three things in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're not necessarily physical. He's not seeing them with the physical eye. First thing that Jesus sees in the Garden of Gethsemane is the frailty of man. Now remember, we said that Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him into the garden. And it looks to me like the reason that Jesus took those three men with him is because of the fact that perhaps he would need some encouragement himself during this very troublesome time that he was just about to enter. Now, before this, Jesus was the one who always encouraged the disciples. You read the gospel accounts, it was always Jesus there who would pick these guys up when they were troubled and dust them off and get them back on the right path again. Jesus was with them so often and helped and encouraged them as well. And now then, the 
the table seems to be turned a little bit, and it kind of looks like that Jesus is one that perhaps needs some, some strength and encouragement from the apostles as well. Now, the Bible tells us what happens to these three men, and in fact, unfortunately, they sort of fail the test. In Matthew chapter 26, in verses 40 and 41, the Bible says, Then he came to the disciples after he had prayed the first time, asking for God to remove that cup from him. The Bible says, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He would go a second time and pray and fall down again, pray, and again come back the second time. And verse 43 says, And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he leaves for a third time and goes and prays and comes back again. And he says in verse 46, Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. What is so sad about this picture is that at Jesus' greatest need for human companionship, the disciples let him down. They failed him. They weren't there for him. And so I think Jesus obviously saw the frailty of man in this situation. Now, Jesus made the statement about these guys that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, when he's talking about the flesh here, I think he's talking about the, the basic instincts of our human nature here. You know, doing the right thing is not always easy to do. Oftentimes, we know what's right. We even have a desire to do what's right. And our conscience even pushes us toward doing what's right. But because we live in a body that can fall prey to fleshly desires, we sometimes let the flesh control us rather than we control it. Now, this weakness, this frailty of man that Jesus saw here was not something new. Unfortunately, this is sort of the story of man from the very beginning. You remember back in the Garden of Eden? Remember there that God basically gave the man everything he needed and asked him to do a job, to dress the garden, take care of it, and to avoid eating from that one tree. And I think when we look at the Garden of Eden and what God did for them, we can sort of borrow a phrase from 2 Peter chapter 1 and say that God gave them everything they needed for life and godliness. He gave them everything they needed in the Garden of Eden. And you know what happened? They failed. The frailty of man. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and brought them to the land of Canaan, especially brought them to Mount Sinai, remember what they had just seen? They had seen God bring Egypt to its knees. They had seen God perform those ten great plagues upon Israel, upon Egypt. Right? They had seen God destroy the army of Egypt in the Red Sea. And they came to the, the, the Mount Sinai, God gave them the law they saw and experienced and heard the trembling of the mountain when God did all these things. And do you know what happened to that group of people? They failed. God allowed the children of Israel to enter the promised land and conquer. And God said to them, Be faithful to me, obey my covenant, and avoid idolatry. And you know what happened to those folks? They failed. You know, God did not just completely ignore the Gentiles. God had something to do with work. Now, he didn't give them the law of Moses. They weren't expecting to obey the law of Moses. But he did give them something that Paul calls in Romans chapter 2, the law in the heart. And you know what happened to the Gentiles? They failed. You see, that, unfortunately, is a history of man. We Fail. And that's what Jesus saw in the Garden of Gethsemane, even with the apostles on this situation. There's a passage in the book of Romans I want us to consider. In Romans chapter 7, 
verses 14 through 20. I want you to notice the frailty of man described in this passage. For we know that the law is spiritual. I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. Now, Bible scholars are a little bit, maybe argumentative or disagreed over this passage. There are some that believe this is talking to Christians, and there are some that believe this is not talking to Christians. I happen to be of the persuasion that he's not talking to Christians in this context. Because these people, whoever it is, they are sold under sin. And also that sin dwells in them. In fact, probably Paul is either referring perhaps to himself, or perhaps referring to the unconverted man, or perhaps he's referring to the good moral man who's trying to please God and can't do it. But whatever the case may be, whichever side, that passage teaches the frailty of man. Man is frail. And man does not accomplish all so often what God wants him to do. And there are other scriptures in the New Testament, like Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, I believe, that teaches as Christians we struggle through this same thing as well. You know, a few years ago, there was this little sign that people used to make for losers. Remember what it was? You ever seen somebody do that? I don't know the people do it today that much, but a few years ago, that was a pretty common thing. Believe me, I saw it a lot, because I think people were using it to refer to me. But the thought is, loser, you're a loser. Well, I think we need to change that L, and I don't know how to do that hand-wise, but change it to an F. For frailty. As humans, we're frail. And that's what Jesus saw in the Garden of Gethsemane. But thankfully, there's this wonderful passage in Psalms 103, verse 14, that says concerning God, He knows our frame, and He remembers that we're dust. And I'm really thankful for that, that God does know our weaknesses. Now, we're ready to move on to the second thing that Jesus. Saw. Jesus saw in the Garden of Gethsemane the suffering that was going to come on him. And in some cases, we may say Jesus saw the wrath of God in that situation. You remember how he repeatedly prayed to God, please take this cup away from me. What was the cup? It was the cup of suffering. Jesus was about to endure intense suffering, painful, perhaps even frightening suffering and it was obviously something that bothered him there was something about this suffering that he was about to endure that was very troubling now in the old testament there is oftentimes the reference to a cup of suffering or a cup of wrath that would come from god for example look at this passage here job chapter 21 and verse 20 let his eyes see his destruction and let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. In Ezekiel chapter 23, verses 32 through 34, thus says the Lord God, you shall drink of your sister's cup, the deep and wide one, you shall be laughed to scorn and held in derision. It contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria, you shall drink and drain it. You shall break its shards and tear at your own breast, for I have spoken says the Lord, a cup of suffering, intense suffering. In Psalm 75 and verse 8, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. And one more, Isaiah 51 verse 17, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. 
You have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling, and he drained it out. In some sense, Jesus was feeling intense concern about the suffering that he was about to undergo. Now, I don't understand everything about his suffering. I don't understand everything that's happening in the suffering. But I do understand that whatever it was, it really affected Jesus. It was really something that he asked three times if God could remove this. And so we have to remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was suffering. And in fact, he was suffering so much and about to, in fact, suffer more that if something had not been done, he very well could have died in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, in the different accounts of the Bible, it describes to us how Jesus reacted in his fear of this cup of suffering. In Matthew's account, this is the way that it describes how Jesus felt. It says he was sorrowful. He was deeply distressed. He was exceedingly sorrowful even to death. In Mark's account, the Bible says there that he was troubled, deeply distressed, and exceedingly sorrowful even to death. And then in Luke's account, the Bible there says that he was full of agony. He felt agony and sweat like great drops of blood fell from his face. Folks, the Bible is plain. The Lord suffered intensely in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, when we think of the Lord's suffering, we think of, well, maybe it's on the cross. Sure enough, he did suffer on the cross. But we might back up. We might say, oh, the Lord suffered when he was scourged by the Romans. And sure enough, he did suffer when he was scourged. So maybe even before that, he was he suffered when those Jewish authorities arrested him and they beat him up, so to speak, and they slapped him and they hit him with their face and all that. Yes, he suffered then as well. But you keep backing up and come to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it specifically says that the Lord there was suffering so much even to the point of death. Now, when you combine all of these different descriptions about the suffering of Jesus and everything that he was about to undergo there, then what we see is that Jesus faced a sorrow and agony that brought him to the point of death. He was completely surrounded by, encircled with suffering. And Jesus was facing something in which he needed strengthening from God as well. One other thing here on this point, and that's the very name of the seminar, plays a very important role in the suffering that Jesus is undergoing. You know what the word Gethsemane means? You know what it literally means, Gethsemane? It means olive fat or olive press. Now, you know, back in biblical times, the olive oil was very, very important to their culture as far as their worship to God, also their daily lives as well. And so scattered throughout the country, there were these olive vats. And a lot of times what they did is they carved these things out of rock. And so they would have a big stone. They would carve an indention down into that stone and create some kind of little canal that would come down into another stone below that where they would carve a hole in that as well. And they would take a, a basket full of olives. And I'm told the first thing they'd do is cr they'd crunch them. They'd break the outer skin on those olives. And then they'd put those olives into that vat, and they had a heavy stone that they put on top of those olives. And what it did is it squeezed the juice right out of it. And you can see, obviously, the parallel with what's going on with Jesus. Jesus, in a sense, is being squeezed by this pressure. And it's about to bring the lifeblood out of him. That's what Jesus saw at Gethsemane. Jesus saw suffering. One more. Jesus saw the power of submission in the Garden of Gethsemane as well. Remember that there are three times that Jesus prayed, Father, take this cup away from me. But do you also remember what he also said in addition to that? He didn't just say, Father, take this cup away. But he added something else to it. And he said, if it's your will, if it be your will, 
take this cup away from me. Jesus submitted to the will of God, and Jesus saw the power of submission. Now, you know, submission is not a term that a lot of people like. We don't like the concept of being in submission to anyone. Back when I used to teach school, for some reason, from time to time, in some of our classes, the concept of marriage would come. And a student would ask me something about marriage. Now, I wasn't supposed to teach the Bible to school kids. We live in kind of a crazy age. But anyway, we weren't supposed to really bring it up. So I'll guarantee you, if a student asks me a Bible question in class, I answer. Regardless of whatever the school said, if they ask a Bible question, we're going to answer it. We're going to talk about it. So I would have sometimes kids ask about marriage. And, you know, I would make the statement that, ladies in class, you know when you get married, you're supposed to be in submission to your husband. Well, that went over like a lead balloon for some of these young girls. They didn't like it. And they would let me know in no uncertain terms, when I get married, I am not going to be in submission. My husband, I am my own boss in this situation. So the concept of submission sometimes is a little bit boring to people today. I performed a wedding ceremony up in a certain place, and it involved a certain couple who I will not mention names of or the place where they are. I thought it was really unusual because a young lady that I was performing the ceremony for came to me and said, I want you to specifically put the word obey in your marriage ceremony. Now, I don't know if it's in there or not. So I had to go back and look, and it probably wasn't in there, so I specifically added obey to her vows when she took her marriage vows. You see, a lot of people don't like this concept of submission. Can you imagine the President of the United States submitting to some third world country king or president who comes to visit us? There's something about submission that we don't like. But I want to suggest to you tonight that it is in submission that we plug ourselves into the power of God. If you want to experience the power of God in your life, and I'm not talking miraculously, but if you want to experience the power of God and how God can strengthen you, it comes about through our submission to Him. Kind of like cell phones. I think everybody here has probably got cell phones. And one of the worst things that can happen to us, you know, is be out in the middle of nowhere and run out of juice. Now, that's a terrible thing. Isn't it? Cell phone loses power. What do we have to do in order for our cell phone phones to have their power? you got to plug it in. you have to plug it in to a source of power. Well, that's what submission does. When we submit to God, in a sense, figuratively speaking, we're kind of like that cell phone that's being plugged into the source of power, and we can receive the power that we want. Now, let me mention a scripture on that. In James chapter 4 and verse 10, James says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Submit to God. Practice submission. If you will practice submission through humility, the Bible says, He will lift you up. That's where our power comes from. And that's what Jesus saw in the Garden of Sin. Jesus saw the power of submission. Now, while he's in the Garden, when he prays to God in Matthew's account, the Bible says on one occasion, Jesus says, my Father, which is kind of interesting because those who take the time to, to count some of these things say that's the only time Jesus ever called the God the Father, my Father. Now, he called him Father, so I'm not saying he ever called him Father. But I'm told that this is the only time in the Gospel accounts that Jesus uses the word my, my Father, indicating, you know, a personal relationship with God. And if you turn over to Mark's account of the very same passage, Garden of Gethsemane, you'll find that Jesus, as he's praying, calls him Abba, Father. Now, do you know the history behind the word Abba? And if you ever looked at your Bible closely, and you're going to find every time that word occurs, it's always translated Abba, the Aramaic version of that word. 
it's never translated differently as far as I know. Now, I haven't looked at every English translation, so I can't say this unequivocally. But about all of the English translations I've ever looked at always just give us that, that word Abba instead of translate it like it does other words as well. You know why? You know what that word Abba means? Well, it's a term of endearment between a child and perhaps its father. And it's a very special, loving, intimate relationship. And the closest way we could ever describe that word Abba and try to translate it is to use the word Daddy. Now, it looks to me like that would be sort of disrespectful to God to humble him and bring him down on that level. And all the Bible translators think the same way too. So they don't translate that. They just sort of transliterate it or whatever the word is and just use Abba instead of that. That's Jesus. That's Jesus being submissive to God. He saw the power of submission. Now, I want to show you something here that it really does illustrate the power of submission. Not too long after this, Judas will bring those armed guards with him. And they will come and they will try to capture Jesus and try to take him away. And remember that Peter had made the boast, Lord, I'll be you again. Lord, all these other guys may hightail it. But you can depend upon me. Lord, I'll die for you. And you know, it, it seems like he was going to do it, at least at first. Because when they tried to arrest Jesus, it was Peter that whipped out his sword and took a slash at that servant of the high priest. It looked like he's tired trying to take his head off. But anyway, he took off his ear. But do you remember now what Peter, what Jesus says to Peter in John 18, verse 11? So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Do you see the difference in what Jesus says here, and what he said previously about the cup. Previously, he said, let the cup pass from me. Father, take the cup away from me. Don't let me go through this. Now then, Jesus has accepted the will of God. And he says to Peter, are you going to keep me from fulfilling the will of God? Are you going to keep me from drinking that cup which the Father has given me? It's no longer taken away from me. It's now... I'm going to do it. And you're trying to keep me from doing it. All of this illustrates what Jesus saw in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus saw the power of submitting to God. The power of submission. Well, I want to bring our study to a close now. And I want to read a passage that we're going to use to sort of indicate where we've got the title on in in our lesson. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. So in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death. Now, most of the commentators that I've checked with believe that this refers back to the Garden of Gethsemane, that this is talking about what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And if it is, you'll notice that not only did Jesus pray and pray vehemently, but he prayed with tears. And thus, from this verse, and perhaps what happened as well, we come up with the title for our lesson this evening, Even Kings Cry. Now, we've been trying to stress throughout this little series of meetings that Jesus is king. And he is the king who royally entered Jerusalem he is the king that cleansed house. He was the king that they tried to trap that we studied about last evening. And tonight, he's the king that we can say even kings are. We'll end our study there. Lord willing, tomorrow morning, we're going to continue. And we're going to talk about the idea that even kings die. There's not only cry, they die. So we can talk about the death of Christ in the morning. Tomorrow afternoon, 
in this little short series of meetings with the idea that kings reign yes. And you want to see at the resurrection of Christ, Jesus brought yes to some of those people that he appeared to as well. Right now, we're going to sing our song of invitation. If you're here and you're not a Christian, we stand ready to assist you and help you in making the most important decision in your life. There's no question, no decision you'll ever make more important than whether I want to serve God and I'm willing to serve God. If you're here and you have not taken steps, the Bible tells us the gospel was given for your salvation. Faith and repentance, the confession of Christ and baptism, you can be added to the Lord's church. Sometimes we stray, sometimes we sin. The Bible tells us on that occasion, we need to repent of our sins, confess our wrongs, and pray to him for forgiveness. The invitation song has been specifically chosen tonight because it perfectly, I think, illustrates what happened in the Garden of Sin. Hopefully this song will touch your heart and help you see the beauty of what happened in the Garden of the So this time, let's stand and sing our song for the church.